so much for uh, the wonderful invitation to, to come speak here today and for your time. Uh, really excited to be here. Uh, kind of thinking about democratizing and making ML and AI more useful as a topic very near and dear to my heart and to the research we've done on campus and beyond. And uh, today I want to talk a little bit about some of the pitfalls we've found in, in this, you know, last say five to ten years of, of exuberance around ML and AI. And starting to get to the point of understanding what is really working well and what are we going to double down on and in some cases scale back in terms of uh, investment and enthusiasm uh, in AI and ML. So just by way of introduction, um, I wear sort of two hats. Uh, I'm on the faculty at Stanford where I co-lead the Stanford Dawn Project. It's a five-year project uh, around making ML more usable and building tooling around putting data to work. I'm also the founder and CEO of a recently started, about 12 years, 12 months old data analytics company uh, called CC Data, which is commercializing uh, some of the lessons we've learned in this space. So we're filtering in, we're getting close to standing room only, and in part because in some sense, this is the golden era of data and ML. I mean, we've, we've really seen unbelievable advances in the use of an application of, of AI and ML, it seems like every week there's a new article talking about hey, how AI is having effects on everything from planning and retrieval, autonomous vehicles, medicine, uh, even you know comedy. Um, and yet at the same time, you know, looking at where we are in 2019, there's also a bit of an undercurrent where it sort of feels like we're not quite there yet. And many of the promises that I believe is, have, that we've both made in the public sphere and also have brought so many of us to AI and ML have yet to really come to fruition. We start to see this with some, some relatively uh, public struggles among AI and ML providers to be able to live up to the hype and the expectation that was set uh, out in front of folks in this space who are trying to deploy and actually productionize ML. And we see these often very expensive consulting oriented approaches where AI and ML works in, say, one or two domains, it's very hard to scale into, say, a successful, repeatable business or a successful, repeatable process. And, and what I want to do in the start of this talk is kind of reflect a little bit on, you know, where are we missing uh, sort of the, the promise, right? Where are we seeing gaps? And, and what are the sort of inconvenient truths that, from our perspective, you know, on campus and off, are really um, some of the key sticking points where expectations don't quite meet reality? And the first of these sort of inconvenient truths that we'll start with is that to actually get highly accurate machine learning requires a large amount of training data. So, you know, the pictures up here are drawn from a very famous training data set known as ImageNet, which is about 14 million labeled images. And my colleague Fei Fei Li, back when she was at Princeton, spent about $300,000 of research money collecting uh, labels for each of these. This is a picture of a cat, a dog, a fire hydrant, and so on, to basically collect uh, enough data to learn from. This is actually one of the best investments in AI I believe we could have made over the last 10 years, and that this $300,000 worth of training data has led to massive advances in terms of image recognition, recognition capabilities and large numbers of applications of image processing in range of verticals. But even today, collecting enough training data beyond, say, the generic images found in the ImageNet data set remains challenging. And just to, just to give an example, if you haven't used these models, collecting training data for realistic tasks is a real, is a real burden. So if I have a well sort of um, positioned picture like this, where I've got my cat and my bicycle and my car, you know, where each of these are, are sort of shown to the camera in perfect proportion, you know, ML and off-the-shelf models work really well. But as soon as we start to look at images that don't look like what was in the training data set, for example, this dog on the floor with a blanket that's partially occluding it, you know, ML tends to make mistakes. And if we go out of distribution entirely and start showing our models pictures of electronic components, you know, life starts getting uh, a lot more complicated, right? This is definitely not a person. This is a capacitor, or it's a, it's a um, resist variable resistor. And, you know, understanding when our AI and ML is wrong, I think we'll have a great conversation about this in the enterprise ML track, um, is challenging as well. So, you know, how do, so we all know this is the Queen of England, right? Which is, which is fantastic. And so if we wanted to actually label celebrities, we need to get more training data about celebrities and so on. But beyond just these realistic tasks, what about sensitive tasks, right? What about tasks for which there's only a handful of us, maybe one or two of us in the room who can actually understand what we're looking at? 
For example, some of our colleagues in radiology in the Stanford Med School, right, it's much harder to get them to label images than to go out on Mechanical Turk and ask, you know, is this cancer? What, what form is this? What is the prognosis for this patient? Right? Some of the most valuable tasks in the enterprise, like looking at fraud detection and understanding customer sentiment and CSAT, right? these are actually very hard, and, and in many cases, the data is too sensitive to send out to the public cloud in order to get labels. And for the most accurate tasks, a new set of research coming from a bunch of you know, very big names, so Google, Baidu, so on, has shown that for the capacities of modern deep networks, the more data, the better. These networks do not saturate. And that means that if you're trying to compete on accuracy, getting this training data will become a competitive advantage, for, especially for highly uh, specialized tasks, whether or not it's in medicine or in financial services. So our first inconvenient truth of this talk is that training data is pretty scarce for many valuable tasks. We may not just have it you know, apparent and, and ready to go throw into a machine learning model, and it's going to take some time to get that data. The second inconvenient truth is that for many enterprises, which I believe where many of us are coming from today, data is actually in relatively structured forms, right? So inside of a major retailer, you likely have decades of transaction data detailing orders that were placed, purchases that were made, products that were shipped, and so on. And these, this transaction data lives inside of tables and relational databases, or inside of increasingly cloud data warehouses, Snowflake, Redshift, BigQuery. A large fraction of this data goes entirely unused today. Right? Storage has gotten cheap enough, we just store this data and, and, and we'll use it on a rainy day. The challenge specifically around this structured data, which represents much more than, say, image data or textual data, the bulk of the data available in enterprise, is actually not that useful for deep learning. So specifically, deep networks and the amazing advances we've seen, you know, the demos in image recognition and, and, and text generation, it's not necessarily a panacea for getting high accuracy for this type of tabular data. One of my favorite examples of this is a paper, and I'm going to pick on Google again. They appear a lot in this talk because they are the best and they do some amazing work. They wrote a paper last year, got a ton of press, called Scalable and Accurate Deep Learning with Electronic Health Records, where they applied deep learning to patient records and predicted things like uh, uh, inpatient mortality and readmission with remarkable accuracy. The amazing thing about this result, however, besides the fact that it's feasible to do this, was actually that deep networks weren't really the secret to getting high accuracy at all. In fact, as uh, someone pointed out on Twitter shortly after the paper was published, one of the simplest types of machine learning models, a linear model known as logistic regression, this is what we teach in the first lecture of the Stanford uh, machine learning class, actually receives almost the exact same accuracy as our deep network, right? And it, it is close to the noise. And in many cases, if you look on Kaggle or you look at what actually gets deployed in, in production, much simpler models like gradient-boosted trees are actually more effective than deep learning. If you do a study of the recent machine learning papers in NeurIPS and ICML and iClear, for tabular data, the bar to beat for DeepNet is a, is a, is a decision tree, not a, uh, a deep network architecture. So the second inconvenient truth that I believe is holding us back here is that most enterprise data is actually structured. It's in tables. It's a bunch of events that have been collected. But the deep networks that are so cool, that really can do amazing things for our cars and for you know, understanding sentiment from tweets online, they don't help us with understanding things like risk or understanding customer satisfaction if our data is stored in tables rather than these unstructured formats. And the third inconvenient truth that I want to cover today is that AutoML, which has seen so much uh, hype and, and promise uh, is not a panacea. So specifically, AutoML is really promising to make uh, highly accurate models very easy to develop, right? So a bunch of articles about this. The, the idea being we throw all of our data into an AutoML system and we'll spit out a model that is high quality and we can simply you know, deploy it and use it in production environments. It is the case that AutoML is getting quite good. So pull up a recent paper from uh, AAAI, one of the top AI conferences, compared to just throwing in the raw features, like the raw data that you would see row by row in a database, we can get about an 8% lift in accuracy. However, we're still at about 70% accuracy for these particular predictive tasks, right? And while this is an important lift, 
Uh, it's certainly not the case that I would want to put a 70% accurate uh, churn analysis tool into production and fire all of my customer success teams, right? Or for example, um, send out a bunch of coupon codes to my users, um, as opposed to having a marketing operations or a marketing analyst actually understand, you know, what are the nuances in our particular product and customer base that should inform what we do with our day-to-day -day marketing operations. And, and AutoML is getting much, much better at getting close to human accuracy. So for example, another paper from IBM showed that they could achieve close to you know, the top 15% of Kaggle uh, uh, competitors with simple you know, auto, actually not that simple, this is a cool paper, but you know, basically state-of-the-art AutoML approaches, but it's still not knocking the socks off of uh, uh, you know, end users in terms of getting incredibly 99% you know, accurate models. And, and um, just last night, or actually this morning, I, I, Google had another fantastic post. You know, what they're really looking at with their state-of-the-art commercial solutions is something that gets in the order of 40th percentile to 85th percentile um, quality compared to a human analyst going and building models. So in a nutshell, I think we've put a lot of emphasis on this AutoML, AutoML, AutoML. But the ROI is limited and is certainly not a cure-all to get to the point where we can simply throw data into, throw data into an AutoML system, get models out, deploy the models, and, 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 and move on with our lives. And these are the types of inconvenient truths that we've seen time and again working with our industry partners on campus, working with customers off campus, where the expectation that AI and ML is going to come in and automate every workflow in a modern IT, marketing, sales, product organization, this is where we see expectations falling short of reality. So the question for us, especially in this room, in this entrepreneurship conference, is what can we do about it? Right? Are we simply going to hit the trowel of disillusionment and give up on AI and ML? I certainly hope not. And in our research, we found really three strategies that are most effective for utilizing ML that essentially balance the capabilities of the current state of the art with the potential for effectively deploying these models in a production environment. And I'll go through three uh, briefly and then go into a bit more detail with a particular case study. So recall that training data was a particular bottleneck, right? How am I gonna get all of these examples of say fraudulent customer records? Or how am I gonna get all these examples of, of great customer service interactions? Or how am I going to understand um, you know, what marketing campaigns to launch? Well, the reality is in most cases, in an enterprise context in particular, given that AI and ML is not going to completely automate away the existing business processes, you can use the information about the processes that have been put in place as a form of training data. In short, you can start to use the data you already have to start to get decent models off the shelf. Take the large data sets that are already structured inside of largely transactional, relational, and, and data lakes, and actually put that data to work. And by, so, so two parts here. One part is really exciting uh, collaboration with Google from some of my colleagues in Don. Well, they essentially looked at, at ad click prediction um, and some of the challenges in ad, ad uh, machine learning modeling at Google with the Google Ads team. And it turned out that even inside an organization like Google, there's a huge range of data sets that are available, that are stored in, in large scale storage systems, but just have not been applied, have not been used as inputs to train these models. There's a bunch of technical challenges for why this is the case. One of the biggest problems is actually being able to label each and every, say, uh, ad impression or each fraudulent ad exactly and precisely. But what this really exciting collaboration showed was that with new techniques that allow us to, for example, take a rule an analyst has in their head, for example, if a particular term is found in an ad, it is likely spam, and apply this at scale to terabytes of data, we actually turn this data that today is never read. It's part of that one third of data or less that most organizations are, are um, collecting but never touching, and actually put that data to work. And most excitingly, one of, the, one of the technical advances that's occurring is what's called multitask learning, where I can take a model that's trained on, say, sales data. It learns a representation of my customer, and instead of, instead of starting from scratch when I go to the product team, I can reuse that same representation of a customer, or representation of, say, a click or an event across these different modeling scenarios. And that transfer learning can radically boost the quality 
of these models that are trained, again, on data that's already present inside of organizational contexts. This is great for getting training data, but it doesn't solve another problem that we discussed, which is that, in general, we aren't getting amazing models out of the gate. Right? We're not going to get you know, human caliber uh, uh, models in many cases, and this is, again, why we're seeing large industrial initiatives fall a little bit short. And I think the key message here that we found is rather than striving for complete automation of existing workflows, think about ML as a means of augmenting existing human resources. And specifically, we talked about this a little bit uh, in, the, in the opening here. If you think about your interactions with ML and AI today, right, in a consumer setting, you have hundreds or thousands of interactions with models um, in, an, in, in, in sort of an average day. And in many of these cases, the ML is not telling you what to do or how to do it, but it's giving you cues and hints in terms of what you might be, what you should be doing, what you might want to watch, what you might want to go and look at. A news feed is not an imperative. It's not your boss telling you, go and read all of these articles. It's telling you these might be interesting. They might be relevant to you. And for example, you know, when, I, when I woke up this morning, I had to ask, how do I get to TyCon? And I Googled, you know, how do I get to TyCon 2019? Right? You know, the kind of ML dream would be that you know, Google would schedule an Uber for me. It would plug in the address. I'd have a coffee waiting for me when I get in the car. Um, and and like Google's like amazing, right? It's like the, it's, they're probably the most advanced data product on the planet. Is my favorite Stanford startup, aside from CSU Data. Um, but all I get from Google is a list of results. And this list of results is useful, right? I can click in, as I did, to figure out, hey, we're at the Santa Clara Convention Center. I can actually uh, subsequently go and look up where that's located, what the drive time is, and so on. But Google's not automating my entire workflow. It's simply pointing me to the right information. That's like that kind of metaphor of augmentation rather than complete automation that I think is where we're seeing already uh, certainly on the consumer side, AI and ML work out well in the form of recommendations as opposed to taking actions and complete automation. On the enterprise side, it's much, much closer to reality, right? It's taking existing knowledge workers' workflows and making those knowledge workers more productive. Third strategy, one of my favorites. Again, something we already see in the consumer setting but seems to have been lost in a lot of the hype around enterprise ML is the idea that we should ship early and improve over time. Rather than shooting for the highest quality models, if we've, if we've bought in the idea that our models are going to be advisory, that are going to help recommend what to do, as opposed to telling us exactly what we should be doing, right? Removing the human from the loop. If a human is in the loop, we can get predictions quickly and start to improve over time. And you know, I do this all the time, right, when I'm on Pandora or Spotify, right? The expectation is not that the station I create, you know, from, um, from my browser is perfect at the, at the start. You know, I don't expect Elton John to be my DJ, you know, literally sitting and, and choosing what songs I should play next. But rather, in the UI here, for example, in, in, in this ML product, Pandora, actually encourages me as a user to provide feedback with the expectation, as a user, that I will get better over time. It's that understanding and setting expectations. We're going to give you our best guess. And over time, our best guess will get better and better and better. And eventually, you'll never click the up and down arrows anymore. And again, understanding the workflows in an enterprise for which this type of advisory um, iterative improvement is most valuable is really where we see AI and ML having the biggest bang for the buck. So our principles for sort of practical enterprise ML are the following. If we don't have enough training data for highly specialized tasks, let's start with the data we do have, which is largely structured and available, increasingly clean, in large-scale data lakes. Rather than shooting for full automation of, of enterprise workflows, shoot for augmentation rather than, rather than automation. And then, again, you know, the great is the enemy of the shipping. Right? We want to actually ship these models and get feedback on them over time. And just to make this a little bit more concrete, I'm going to draw on one case study from our work in Dawn, specifically around helping users understand the key factors driving their business metrics. So one of the key problems we found very early days in Dawn was overwhelmingly product owners would ask questions like, you know, why is user engagement dropping today? Right? What's going on? And I'm sure for those of you who run, say, a, a product team or sales, marketing, you have some operational component, you're checking your dashboards every day or every week, wondering, wondering why is this metric changing? 
And there's sort of a couple, couple different approaches to doing this. One of my favorite is kind of DIY. So for, the, for example, for this application um, provider, mobile application provider we worked with very early on, you know, they would sometimes go in and slice and dice and say, maybe there's something going on with a new application release. Maybe there's something going on with a given uh, 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 version of the, um, uh, sorry, application release, maybe it's something going on with a given you know, ISP, maybe it's going on, something going on with a given uh, type of hardware. You know, there's all these different possible variables. Let's go poke around. Most of the time, DIY doesn't get us the right answer. So we'll, if we have time, go over to the business analysts and data scientists. And these guys basically will go and do the meticulous analysis required, they'll run the regression models, and they'll say, here's, here's what's going on. It's actually these users in this geo that are disproportionately co correlated with uh, engagement, and that's where the dip is coming from. But there's really never enough time for these data scientists and analysts, and frankly, the data scientists and analysts don't like doing the slice and dice work, because it's repetitive. You have to go and test a bunch of hypotheses. And at the end of the day, you, you send a slide deck back a couple days later and say, here's what we think is happening. So we started asking on the research side, you know, what could we do instead? And what is specifically challenging about this problem? Well, if I think about this from a statistics perspective, when I'm asking why are some users reporting unusually low engagement, there's actually a giant space of hypotheses that I might go and want to test. For example, I've got 25 different software releases. If I'm on the Android device ecosystem, I've got 24,000 different hardware types. And fundamentally, the challenge here is that humans just aren't that fast at looking at data. So spending even one second per combination of factors here, per potential hypothesis, requires seven days of analyst time. So as an example of augmentation, not automation, we asked this question, how could we take this process of hypothesis testing and ranking the hypotheses and actually automate that? So we did a bunch of research into you know, how do we do this in a scalable manner, uh, how do we do it with low latency over streaming data, and we actually ended up deploying some of the, of some of the results um, at, at very large scale and collaborating with folks at Google, deploying at Microsoft and Facebook, and what we found is that it would be possible to, at machine scale with machine caliber precision, actually test this entire space of hypotheses programmatically take the boring part out of the analytics process to identify factors like a beta version of the latest iOS release are having a problem collecting data. In fact, there's nothing wrong with engagement. It's just that the sensors aren't working, which is actually kind of funny because from a human perspective, if you ask why is engagement dropping, you're not going to think, oh, well, maybe the software is broken, right? You think there's something going on with the given users. And so we essentially um, realized that as a target for this type of workflow augmentation, this type of manual analysis is, is ripe for uh, automation. And since, and I want to I use this as a kind of a case study for putting these principles into practice, we've commercialized some of the work in, in the form of, you might have heard at the beginning of, this, of, the, of the talk, um, uh, analytics platform that we call Sisu. And you know, little tongue in cheek, we think of Sisu as an automated analyst team that never sleeps, complains, or blinks. <laughs> and, and just to show these principles in practice, the way that Sisu helps these users understand why and puts these principles in practice, we don't try to do ETL or data cleaning for our users. We simply connect to structured data lakes that users already have using KPIs like engagement here that they're already trying to analyze. Rather than trying to tell them everything about what's going on with engagement and what to do, what marketing campaigns to run, what users to reach out to, and so on, we instead allow them the ability to diagnose their KPIs and identify the top factors in real time. Just like your news feed in Facebook tells you what you might want to go look at, the feed in Sisu tells you which factors within your business here, you know, a given account, tab, account type and a given location with a given feature flag is behaving differently than usual. So again, it's not saying go roll back this feature flag or go send more ads to the Asia Pacific region. We're simply telling users, here's what's going on and making it explainable intuitive so they can say, I see why I saw this prediction, I can get behind this, and I'm going to go and share it with my, with my teammates, say, in marketing or operations or products. And perhaps most importantly, towards this goal of shipping early and getting better over time, we can use the feedback and the behavior and the actions that users are performing in the platform as a form of training data. You expect your Google searches to get better over time because other people are searching. Similarly, when you're sharing facts between users within Sisu, that gives a signal into what users care about and we can further improve result quality. So in both this research context and in production, in terms of productionizing these principles, we use data that's present in large structured data lakes as a way of using the data users already have. So we don't have to go and collect large amounts of training data from outside of the system. 
Rather than trying to automate, say, a marketing team's job or a product team's job or a, or, or a sales team's job, we want to help make those marketing analysts and those product managers look like geniuses, giving them super superpowers by being able to look over everything happened in their business, but leaving the decision up to them as to how to respond and what actions to take. And by delivering results and getting feedback on those results, both from users explicitly favoring or, or hiding facts, but also um, looking at where they're spending their time, where are their eyeballs, just like news feeds in the consumer setting get better, we've seen it's, it's possible to do the similar thing in a business operations context. So zooming out very, very big, I just want to stop with one final um, uh, thought for this crowd, especially around the entrepreneurs assembled here. Uh, many of you will probably recognize this, this graph as uh, the famous Gartner hype cycle. And I think it's safe to say that between the peak of inflated expectations and the trial of disillusionment, in 2019, we're, we're, we're kind of heading down the, <laughs> down the peak, right? I talked to so many uh, uh, potential customers and some users who say, you know, I've tried the AIML stuff. It's all, none of it works for us, right? We tried X and it, you know, we never want to try that again. And I think we're very rapidly, um, you know, coming down this, this trowel. And the question is, you know, when will we get out of this, right? Is this going to be one year, two years? Is it going to be another decade before we actually get to the point where people are willing to trust AI and ML? And I think it's up to us as entrepreneurs to actually smooth out this curve, to align expectations with capabilities, and to deliver products that can actually use data people have, strive for augmentation as opposed to full automation, and iterate with users in the loop to improve over time. So thank you so much for your time. Uh, love to take questions. So, uh it's a great talk by Peter. Given that you have to begin the next panel pretty quickly, we have time for just one question. <laughs> hey, Peter, thanks. That was, that was great. And especially your views on AutoML. My question is, what are your views on very, very piecemeal AutoML, like hyperparameter optimization using SIGOPTS or model selection, or very, very piecemeal? Yeah, great question. So there's a bunch of AutoML is a big umbrella, right? How do we take parts of, of what a data scientist does from hyperparameter tuning, selecting models, um, feature engineering, and basically automate these parts? And there's a bunch of amazing companies, you know, SigOps doing uh, hyperparameter tuning. Uh, I have some friends at Determined AI doing model deployment and placement. These are all necessary components to make data scientists more productive. But I think for the average enterprise user, it's still too low level of an of a abstraction. So I think you have a complementary strategy. For data science teams, these products are super valuable. They will make data scientists run way faster. But there's still never enough data scientists. In fact, for most users we talk to in an enterprise, there's not enough analysts, right? Not to say data scientists. And so, you know, for me, when I was sitting at Stanford, it was if in 10 years the best thing we have for a line of business owner is a BI tool or a hosted Python notebook, something's gone completely wrong given the amount of data that's available for them. I think the emerging challenge for enterprise ML is how do you get bang for the buck for restricted types of workflows without involving those data science teams to begin Perfect. with. Perfect. Thank Thanks. you, Peter. Yep. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Yeah.